ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ Check, 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 check. Check, check, check. Nice check. He's stopped the boards and back down the ice. Yeah. Put his, uh, put his elbow right in that guy's ear hole. He did. Um, for the last three weeks, uh, the last two and a half, three weeks, two weeks, three weeks, I've had running through my head. Don't throw me down, Clark. From, uh-huh. uh, from the movie Christmas Vacation when he's hand- yeah. ha- helping Aunt Bethany... Uh, in the front door and she goes don't throw me down Clark and uh, it's because I've been for the last two or three weeks I've been walking with a cane and every time I start to you know get a little I think I hear don't throw me down Clark well you you know something I have also been walking with a cane on occasion and it uh, it has made a big difference and helped me along to a point where most of the time I don't need it anymore so I think that's it. I think you got to use it. To, uh, it's definitely, I had a pretty, I had a comes and goes. I had a few, I had a few good moments today where the pain wasn't nearly as bad. So I'm thinking, of course, I'm also on these. <laughs> I think what he, wonderful painkillers. Yeah. I think he finally hit the, uh, the Lionel Strang he hit, level. He hit the sweet spot. Yeah. He finally hit the Lionel Strang yeah. level. Yeah. See, my, my chiropractor's and cranking my spine and pushing everything back to where it should be. And that's really helped too. Cool. So. And I got yeah. hooked up with uh, a physiotherapy place in Florida, and nice. they have a big, fancy, big, fancy, fancy training center right beside the Orlando Magic Arena, where they where the they they work on the Orlando Magic. So, all right, so you get to do some physiotherapy and go shoot a few hoops. Yeah, yeah, I'll go shoot a few hoops. But even cooler than that, not that this will mean anything to anybody, but yeah. uh, my main doctor is here in Toronto, Trana, Ontario, Trana, Trana. Uh, I'm working with a physiotherapist there that also works with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, there you go. So I'm like, I'm like, I'm thinking pff, another year of this with the physio guy and get the blades back on. And I'm, I'm going to blaze back on. And you'll be right out of the last of Matthews scoring a bucket load of goals. I'll be a, I'm going to be a walk on tryout at least. There you go. Uh, I have a lot of great, uh, ambitions. It's always good to have ambitions. Yeah. None of them are realistic, but. but you've got to have something to dream for and shoot for, right? So uh, this is, we're going to do this really quick. This is, okay. uh, how's it going so far? <laughs> uh, glacially slow as per usual. Uh, Rapido trains. But it's, it's, it's your fast track to model railroading fun. Rapido trains, your fast track to model railroading fun. <laughs> Well, I'll cut yeah, that you out. Tried to, you tried to sneak that one by me. Well, you? yeah, exactly. I was, I was, I was trying to put that one uh, top shelf with the peanut butter. I know they flashed the leather. Yeah, and, it. And, and you know how you caught it? You stuck your glove out there and rape your rape leg your fa- leg fashion. fashion. Yes. <laughs> the now, Danny Galvin. <laughs> Danny Galvin was an announcer because it's rude to talk on these things without filling in the blanks for people. Yes. So Bruce and I are are. Just both uh, past middle age, just slightly past middle age. So, uh, Actually, well past middle age, unless you're planning to live to be 120 or so. Uh, uh, well, in my life, I'm, I'm, I can dream. Yes, there you go. That's one of your ambitions. Yeah, it's one of my ambitions, yeah. Uh, anyways, in our lifetime, the, the main announcer for the Montreal Canadiens was a fellow named Danny Galvan. And his, yes. his uh, claim to fame was he would use all these fancier, fancy words. And then one of the things in the glove, when a goalie would catch one with a glove hand, you know, every once in a while, he'd go, oh, and Plonk catches that. He stuck the glove out in rapier-like fashion. Yeah, I'm not even sure Savardian what The Savardian spinorama. The Savardian spinorama. Yeah. A cannonading drive. A cannonading drive. Now, here's a fun fact. Years ago, about 1980, somewhere in that range, uh, the NHL All-Star game was at the Joe Louis in Detroit. That was the first... Uh, big event at the Joe Louie. And then the, the Monday after my parents were flying out to Edmonton to see, uh, my sister. So dropping them off at the airport, it was like the who's who's of the NHL. There are all these players flying out of Windsor to get 
to Toronto to get Kentucky flights to wherever they're going. And uh, Danny Galvin was there. He looked like death warmed over. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like you maybe have partayed a little too much. But uh, on the on that same day, on the flight from Toronto to Edmonton, my dad uh, scored Wayne Gretzky's autograph for it, which well, is sitting on my wall in a frame. I met Walter Gretzky, Wayne's dad, three separate yep. times. And each time he talked to me like I was a long lost friend. Yeah. I think Gene, the, uh, Gene met him several times with Special Olympics with uh, yeah. Pico. He loved being Wayne Gretzky's dad. Oh, absolutely. What a great guy he was. Um, anyways, let's get this over with because we got we to gotta make this quick. So yes. this too interview, this, too late. Too this, late. This, yeah, this particular show is yes. a two segments with Shane Wilson from Scale Trains. Okay. It's no longer scaletrains.com. It's now just Scale Trains. Okay. Which I guess is really similar to Rapido Trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. If it's N, if it's H-O, the fast track is Rapido. And anyways, I remember uh, several months ago we had a podcast. I think it was just before Christmas. We had a podcast called The Retail Wars. Yes. And uh, Shane was uh, unhappy, not on, he was a little disappointed, disappointed with the direction the conversation was going, partly on my part, partly on the part of our guests, uh, Lauren James and Stephen Atwell, uh, was uh, got uh, about uh, scale train selling to retailers and dealing with retailers and and everything. Anyways, he called me up and said he was disappointed. And I said, well, you know what? Why don't you come on the show and tell your side of the story? Because we'd be more than happy to give you as much or equal airtime so you could explain your side of the story. Absolutely. So that's what we did in the first hour and 15 minutes. And then I said, let's end this. And then I'll interview you again at Springfield, which was only a couple of months ago. And we'll stick the two together. And there you got yourself a show. I love it when a plan comes together. Absolutely. So, okay, take us to the first segment. Subway chimes, go. Bruce? Lionel? Bruce. Bruce. Lionel, it's a Monday. What's going on, man? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, uh, You know how I have a tendency to put my foot in it? Uh, If you say so. (laughs) You don't think so? Well, I I think, do we need to get, do we need to get that right now or no? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I just, it seems uh, on, o- on occasion, you may have said something that you, or, or, or I, later point in time. or I host people that have a tendency to say things that might annoy other people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember that whole series of really cool, uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I find with railroad manufacturers, uh, model railroad yes. manufacturers and this guy in particular. He's doing this really cool road trip around North America. Uh-huh. And I say to him, hey, this would be something really cool to do on the podcast. So we've done right. two or three road trips with Shane. And I say, text right. me when you're at such and such a place. And he doesn't. He, I oh. never hear from the guy again. Right. So like uh, if we had him, if he was going to be on the show today, I'd be like wildly angry at him for that. Oh, you would? Oh, okay. absolutely. Beside myself. Yeah. So, uh, oh. <laughs> so remember a few weeks ago, months ago, uh, um, we did a show called retail wars. Yes, I do. And during that show, uh, we had Stephen Atwell of Midwest model railroad. Yes. And we had our little buddy, uh, Lauren James from, uh, Otter Valley railroad. This is true. And these are two fine, well-run model railroad shops. Uh, I would uh, agree with that. Have, having been to Otter Valley and uh, ordered from the other guy before, I would uh, agree with that statement. And uh, it's somewhere in that show, I don't specifically remember when, but somewhere in that show, they were talking about scale trains and the fact that they can't buy scale train stuff and sell it in their store. Okay. Yes. Which which I've heard before numerous times, and frankly, from my standpoint, I don't care. I'm not in the model retail, model railroad retail business, or in the manufacturing business, so I don't really care. It's nothing I'm actually am even remotely interested in. 
Right. But uh, somewhere in there, in that conversation, somebody gave the impression that Shane was not would say something that was not unto was not necessarily pleasant about one of the retailers and blah 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 blah. So he called me one day, actually, as I was driving uh, north from Toronto. I was I had just got my wife's car serviced, and I was driving home. And Shane called me and said, you know, he felt pretty bad about what was said on the podcast. Okay. And you know me, I'm usually almost always my answer is, well, if you want to come on the podcast and talk about it, you're more than welcome. This is true. Because I always like to give everybody uh, their opportunity to speak their sides. And so we had that conversation and I said, and I'm going to ask you some hardball questions. And I actually, you know what, to be completely honest, in all my interactions with Shane Wilson, the, uh, I guess he's the president of Scaled Trains, and which uh, I would say is one of the top, one of the top model railroad manufacturers in the world, I guess. They do have lots of neat stuff, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't know ever. I don't know about all of the manufacturers in the world, but there's certainly no doubt in the North American region, people look to Scaled Trains as one of the the top manufacturers with top quality products. Right. And uh, so anyways, I said to him, hey, you want to come on the show and talk about it? You're more than welcome to come on the show and speak your opinions and I'll ask you some hardball questions. And he was all up for that. And uh, Okay. And then I've even uh, let him know that uh, Rapido Trains is our official sponsor, and we're going to put this on the free channel. So Shane okay. has the opportunity to speak to as many people as possible, which is uh, several thousand at least. And yep. uh, uh, and he was like, okay with that, because that's the kind of that's the only interaction I've ever had with Shane. He's always been decent to me, right? And uh, so then I thought to myself, hmm. You know, this show is sponsored by, by Rapido Trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. If it's N, if it's H O, the fast track is Rapido. So I think it would only be courteous if I uh, asked Jason Tron before we went ahead with it. Right. So after I finished talking to Shane, I called Jason, and Jason was like, sure, it's not my show, it's your show. Do whatever you want. Okay. And just make sure you play my jingles. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Which is, and those know. wonderful jingles, thanks to our jingle master, Mr. David Hyde of the <laughs> Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Exactly. Exactly. So that's uh, that's where we're at. So okay. uh, uh, let's get Shane Wilson in here and get the conversation to, to started with him as well as uh, just you and I, because uh, after a while, don't take this the wrong way, Bruce. I don't yeah. want you. I don't want you to be offended. Okay. But after a while, you and I just are boring. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard comments that affect somewhere along the line, but hey, what do they know? Exactly. All right. Uh, Shane Wilson, would you like to come into our studio? I would love to, Lionel. Thank you. All right. Shane Wilson, come on down. Come on down, Shane Wilson of Scale Trains. Look at that. Your Facebook page has, fi- has basically got 60,000 60, plus followers, and it's uh, got all kinds of stuff on there. So did you? were you able to hear me on the intercom in the green room? I was able to hear you on the intercom, and I really appreciate you calling us one of the top manufacturers in the world with top quality products. That's uh, uh, a big compliment and much appreciated. And I and I don't and I don't think there's many people that would disagree with us that statement because I think it that truly is. Uh, me personally, I kind of stand back and watch scale trains and repeat trains, you know, kind of, uh, going at it, but I think it's a friendly rivalry as best I can tell. I mean, I've certainly, okay. I've certainly seen you. Inter- Go, all can right. I ask a question to start? Sure. At one time, I believe you're known as scale trains.com. Now since mm-hmm. scale trains, you dropped the dot com part. Yeah, we did. In the beginning, okay. there weren't really many manufacturers. Well, there weren't any that were selling locomotives direct to the consumer. Okay. And uh, we wanted folks to know you could buy from us as well as the retail channel. And uh, as time evolved and we went to a new website, when we went to the new website, new logo, we dropped the .com part of it. It's still a part of our legal name. We're just okay. not using it day to day. Good. I thought that had a Thanks. nice ring to it. Scaletrains.com. But Scaletrains yeah. does too. Um, True. So can I ask you a question, Shane? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, are you trying to buy everything in the world? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, uh, now we're trying to digest what we bought. That's, that's been a pretty big challenge. So 
No acquisitions on the short-term horizon. Okay. And most of these acquisitions aren't planned anyways, are they? They're just kind of like, hey, you want to, somebody will say something to somebody and you'll say something to somebody else. And before you know it, you guys are, because you know, you, because let's, uh, before we go much uh, further, let's re uh, revisit your history in the hobby. Because as I remember it, uh, even as a teenager, you had started a small retail business. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Opened a hobby store when I was 15. And was it actually like an, a store? Like a, you open the door and you go in and there was inventory? Yeah, we started in um, in our home. We had remodeled the garage and uh, had a small store there. And then probably about three years into it, moved to a retail location in a in a business storefront on a main street in the town that we lived in. Now, how old were you when you did that, when you moved to the storefront location? It's probably about 19. I was wow. I was just at, out of high school, so uh, probably about 19. I don't know. I'm getting old. I can't quite remember now. Yeah. Um, how old are you? Of a gentleman, are you? 54. I have this buddy of mine, uh, Gus, who I played golf with for years and years and mm-hmm. years, and he was exactly 20 years older than me. I'd get to 40, and I'd go, man, I'm old now. And he'd like he'd be sixty, and he'd like, no, you're not. And then I'd get to fifty, he'd be, and I'd be like, oh my god, am I ever getting old? And he'd go, he'd be seventy, like, eh, you're not even close, buddy. So right now I'm sixty nine, and you would you say fifty four? Fifty four. Yeah, you're not even close to old. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, you're getting there. I'll admit that you're getting there. You're past middle age. I, Some days it feels like it. Well, I don't know that many 108-year-olds, so I, I assume you're past middle age. Yep. Um, uh, so, okay, so, like, what was that like? I mean, we're going to get into the other topic that we, wanted to, that we wanted to talk about, but I think it's fun to help people remember and know who you are because that's a big part of uh, uh, Scale Trains. So mm-hmm. do you remember, like, how long did you have the brick-and-mortar store? Had that store for probably about two years. I was probably about twenty-one when we ended up uh, closing the store. And was it a was it? Did you close it because it wasn't a money maker, or did you close it because you know it was a fun thing to do? But now it was time to go get an education, or what was the? You know, this would have been back in the eighties, and uh, at that time, you're really young and you're looking at what it's going to take to make money, and uh, would have to really go to the bank and and get a pretty sizable business loan and. And look at the life ahead of you, you're like, man, this business has been pretty hard already. And uh, do I take that risk? And if it goes belly up, I'm in debt for the rest of my life. Or do I go another path? And I chickened out and took the other path. <laughs> <laughs> but and then somewhere in there, you ended up working for, I guess it was Athern. Was it actually Athern that you worked for or Horizon Hobbies? Uh, actually, neither was where I started. Um so I sold insurance for about a year, but no one wants to hear from a snot-nosed early 20-something-year-old kid about buying insurance. So uh, I went to work for a company called Hobby Dynamics that was owned by uh, Bill Bennett of Circus Circus Casinos out in Vegas. And uh, they were in Champaign, Illinois, their distributorship. And after about a year or so, uh, Horizon purchased Hobby Dynamics, one of their proprietary products, their airplanes and JR radios and, uh, and other things. And uh, I came over in the merger, and that would have been in 92, I believe it was, because I started in 91, and uh, and I was with Horizon for, uh, all the way until 2014. Wow. And then and then that's when you and I met was around 2014. The very first time we ever met was in Ottawa, Ontario at a train show, and, mm-hmm. I, and I, we ended up going out to dinner with, it was you, me, and who was the other person that we went out to dinner with? I can't remember. Uh, boy, it's, it's been, I don't remember now myself. Since it was it's been like a while. 10 years ago, but somehow I ended up going out to dinner with you and I thought, oh, how cool is this? I'm going to end up getting to know a big shot at Athern and, uh, and this will be really fun. It'll be, and it was that day that you were, uh, uh, leaving or right around that week or month that you were leaving. That, and that week. Mm-hmm. Barry Silverthorne. That's who we went out to dinner. That's who it was. It was Barry. That's right. right. And, uh. I went, oh, cool. What are you going to be doing? And he went, I can't tell you. <laughs> that was like the first time we'd ever been together or broke bread together or anything. And it was like, and I'm like, what do you mean you can't tell me? 
well, it's just, it's going to be, uh, yeah, I can't tell you. And I'm thinking, I don't even know this guy, and he's already not telling me what it is he's going to do. Which, of course, later turned out to be that you had started, you left Athern and started mm-hmm. your own model railroad manufacturing business, which was scale trains. Right. And so you, yep. go ahead. Back in those days, I mean, when folks would ask me, I'd tell them that uh, the family and I had decided that we were going to move uh, to Tennessee. And because uh, that, that year we actually did decide to move. It was 30 below zero and I was shoveling snow and I walked in the house. And I told my wife, I'm never doing this again. And uh, so we said, well, we'll just tell people we're moving to Tennessee and we'll figure it out when we get there. So you loaded up the truck and you moved to Tennessee. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And let me tell you, when we first moved into this place where we are, was probably one of the darkest nights I've ever seen. And one of the quietest nights. And I'm like, what have we done? But it, it worked out great. Love where we live now. And, and by, by, uh, not on purpose across the street was a small warehouse, which is where you ended up locating scale trains. Mm -hmm. It actually went for sale literally the day after we moved in to the house. And, uh, we have 12 acres here, about, uh, half of that is farm ground. And we were going to build on that acreage. And then I found out how much it was going to be. And my wife kept telling me from the day after we moved in, she's like, you need to go over there and look at that place. And I put her off probably through the winter and, and finally I said, you're right. I'm going to go look. And we ended up buying the building. And then actually there was about five acres next door that we ended up purchasing. So yeah, so it worked out just fine. And now here we are 10 years later and you've got a new warehouse, which is, didn't you say near Chattanooga? Uh, actually in Cleveland, um, it's about 30 minutes from the old warehouse and about 30 minutes North of uh, Chattanooga. It's like, there's actually a, a Cleveland, Tennessee. There's actually a Cleveland, Tennessee. Great little town. Isn't there a model railroad club there? Uh, we are um, in the midst of starting a model railroad club. I, actually, we aren't. Uh, there's a group that is moving into the uh, back part of our warehouse, and they're uh, going to start building a railroad here soon. They're actually taking, uh, of course, you know Todd Arnett. Um, we uh, acquired Todd's railroad a few years ago, and uh, they're using that as their starter railroad, and then uh, after some time, they're going to build their own uh, model railroad in the back of the warehouse. Oh, okay. Hmm. I thought that I've had discussions with a fellow named Tom Klamoski, and I thought for for some reason or other, he told me there was a model railroad club in Cleveland, Tennessee, but maybe I've talked. Uh, to there's some- a, there are a couple in the area. There's two in Chattanooga, and then there's one just across the border in Georgia. So, oh, okay. uh, so and then, of course, one up in Knoxville. So there's quite a few in the area Is uh, within it- an hour or so. And would you say the model railroad scene in the Chattanooga area is fairly, uh, fairly healthy? Yeah, absolutely. So when I, when we first moved down here, it was pretty quiet. Um, but I got to give a gentleman by the name of Roy Masterson, a lot of credit. Uh, Roy stepped up and, and actually became the person that revived the NMRA in the area. And, uh, now he's president of the SER, uh, Southeast, Southeast regional and, and has really worked hard to pull modelers together in the area. And I think us being here too is, I think there are a lot of lone wolf model railroaders here. And, uh, and by having the NMRA presence and our presence and, and the clubs that are here, it's really helped kind of bring people out. There's, there's a lot more modelers here than I think people realized, uh, may say 10 years ago or so. No, that seems to be a common thing that the more you start nosing around and poking around, you find mm-hmm. that, these guys have been hiding somewhere waiting for something to happen. And all of a sudden they're coming out of hibernation and, uh, the, you know, the hobby's just going and going, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Like I've ever seen, it seems like every interview I ever do, I end up discovering something else or somebody else that's uh, involved in model railroading. I think this hobby is absolutely exploding and we're all going to be covered with model railroad goo. But actually I think, <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's a true fact. Like that's a, that you can take that when the next time you're standing in your booth and people or somebody comes by, that's not a, you know, new to the hobby, you can say, well, you might as well get in now because the hobby is exploding and we're all going to be covered with model railroad goo. Okay. Uh, thanks for that imagery. That, that <laughs> it's like the old slime <laughs> from Nickelodeon. Yeah. Well, but it is water soluble goo though. Yeah. So that's good news. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Washes right off. Yeah. But I find that. And, and actually, I think it was Uncle Dave. I don't even remember, but somebody, I was having a discussion with somebody. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to give somebody credit for it, but I was having a discussion recently with somebody. And I think what it, social media has done 
is giving the hobby a brand new mm-hmm. energy that never that it never existed before. I'd agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, uh, that's part of what scale trains is, is this, it, it, because, because you can go on Facebook and see what's happening with scale trains or scale trains can, you know, send out email blasts and all that stuff. You know, it's easy to stay in contact with your favorite manufacturer, your favorite hobby store, your favorite, whatever in the hobby. And I just feel like there's a whole, this whole high level energy thing to all the whole thing. It's made a huge difference. You know, you mentioned how many followers we have on Facebook and we've really grown um, our YouTube presence. We're working on Instagram and TikTok and uh, and the newsletter. I'd say that's still the biggest revenue generator that we do. And we're reaching some, I think we're up to around 40,000 subscribers that we touch every week. So um, it's just amazing the connections you can make in the digital age. 40,000 subscribers you have and wow, that, that's, that's pretty good. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And you know, and we, we haven't really touched on it much, but uh, earlier this summer we acquired a major stake in virtual rail fan. And you want to talk about the digital world. Here's someone that that organization has 450,000 YouTube subscribers seeing upwards of 850,000 unique visitors a month. Wow. And uh, in the neighborhood of like 2 million plus views. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the reach um, that VR has, and that'll be something that we're really going to tap into uh, over the next 12 months. Um, that's a great segue into one of the topics where I'm going to ask you some hardball questions. Sure. Now, I'm not going to throw any at your head, but you're going to get brushed back a little bit. <laughs> this isn't dodgeball, is it? No, it's like a Major League Baseball. Um, okay. Uh, while all the other podcasts try to be politically correct, eh, not so much here. Um, cause I like to ask questions and I think, as I said to you on the, uh, on when we talked on the phone, Hey, I'm happy to have you on. And if you don't agree with something we said, then come on in and disagree with us. We don't mind it being disagreed with. Um, so I think this is a good segue into part of this discussion because, and this is strictly my point of view. This is nobody's point of view other than my own point of view. It seems like scale trains is trying to take over the world. Because, let me explain first, uh, you know, it seemed to be, you know, you bought MTH and then you bought some S-scale stuff and you bought Fox Valley stuff and uh, other stuff. And then, which I didn't really pay much attention to. And then you bought Virtual Rail Fan. And I'm thinking, what are these guys doing? Like trying to be in every nook and cranny of model railroad manufacturing or purchasing? Like I'm thinking... Why? Well, what's the deal with a rail um, virtual rail fan? And then, which also segues into my particular statement, which uh, I have uh, I have no other um, indication other than I've been self employed my whole life as well, running my own business my whole life, um, and relying on myself like you do. Somebody's making money in model railroading, or these guys wouldn't be so. Uh, ad- uh, desperately buying stuff up or like at Rapido Trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. Rapido Trains, your fast track to model railroading fun. Uh, those guys over there, they're always cranking out this model and that model and the next model. So when when manufacturers try to say, oh, well, you know, it's really hard to make money and this and that, I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't think so. I think they're just blowing smoke because, they, you know, it's like, that's what you do when you're in business. You cry that you're poor. So what's the deal with the virtual rail fan thing? Like, why? what's going on there? Well, a couple of, I mean, it's a great question. So we see virtual rail fan as a marketing opportunity for scale trains. It's a chance to reach folks way outside of our normal world. You look at like at uh, the print publications and you know, the big ones today are probably 80,000 or so subscribers each month. The, the largest, and here VR is already reaching somewhat uh, six, seven times that audience uh, every month. So it's a chance to to reach people who have an interest in real trains, and hopefully we get an opportunity to convert some of those folks into new modelers and, and help them enjoy our favorite hobby. That's kind of part one. And then part two, we believe, um, you know, the folks at Virtual Rail Fan did a fantastic job 
at developing the technology and what it takes to live stream real trains. And then you look at VRF TV, that's where you can uh, watch um, digital content of uh, videos, maybe like from the 1980s that uh, you know you don't wanna watch on CD anymore. And that'll evolve here in the coming few years. And we see this, uh, we believe that uh, VR has a real opportunity to grow. And what VR really needed was someone or, or a, a group of folks who have um, business savvy that can really make the company uh, more financially viable. And uh, we're going to launch some things at, at uh, the Railroad Hobby Show, kind of the, just like step one. And uh, man, if things go the way we believe, I think in a few years, Virtual Rail Fan will actually uh, be larger than scale trains from a from a revenue standpoint. I can believe that. I can believe that. Like, that makes perfect sense to me. Me, sometimes I feel like I'm on an island out here by myself because me, I think this hobby is just going to continue to grow and explode and become more and more mainstream because people have access to it now. And that makes perfect sense. You own skills or you own virtual rail fan. How can you not have an opportunity to make your business grow? Mm hmm. And and tell me as much as you want to, or as much or as little as you want to. Like, how did that transaction come about? Like, you did you did you approach them? Was there word on the street that they wanted to sell? Like, that's a great question too. So, oh, hang on a minute. You seem to be hung up on some of the questions. Are great. Like, are some of the other questions not so great? <laughs> okay. I, I well, yeah. I guess I need to set that up better, don't I? <laughs> uh, no, they're good too. It's just, uh, I haven't, you know, I don't get asked that very often. So when we first moved to Tennessee, shortly after we were here, uh, I was at a club meeting in Chattanooga and, uh, Mike Sear, one of the owner owners and founders of virtual rail fan was there. And Mike was kind of sharing their numbers back in those days. And I'm sitting there going, man, I would love to own a part of that company someday. And, uh, but I'm like, there's no way, you know, we all have this, this vision that folks that are on YouTube and are successful are making a bazillion dollars. And, uh, I think that's only just a few folks that are really doing that, but that was the impression. And, uh, fast forward, uh, a little to a little over a year ago, um, VR was trying to grow their business, but it, it's always been a challenge. They're, they're kind of on that edge where they're, they're self-sustaining, but they're, and they're growing, but it's not where it could really just launch into the stratosphere. And Mike said he wanted to be able to pay his people a little better. And he's, he said, you know, I've got a guy who's running operations and I can kind of step back and would you, I'd love to come to work for scale trains. And so we worked it out and he came on as our videographer in January of 23. And then sometime in the spring, probably April, May, I was in Mike's office and and there were three gentlemen. Um, there's Mike and, and Justin. Justin's kind of the tech guy. And there was another gentleman that owned the company. And in a passing comment, he mentioned that the third person was uh, had, was ready to, to retire. He, he was an American Airlines pilot and uh, his wife wanted to travel the world. And, and uh, Mike's like, man, I wish I could buy his shares. And he says, I just can't afford it. Justin can't afford it. And I looked at him and said, well, we might be interested. And uh, holy smokes, that snowball started going pretty quickly. And, you know, a month or so later, uh, we bought uh, we bought the third person out and uh, and we were off to the races. So we've been spending the last several months. There's been some things we've had to kind of clean up from the business side of the house. And we spent the uh, probably the last six months getting that done. And, and now we're really ready to take that next step and start to launch what the future of virtual rail fans going to look like. So now did you buy a controlling interest? Uh, so yeah, we do have a controlling interest at this point. Yes, okay. but we've written our contracts so that uh, everyone has an equal uh, say in in how the business is, you know, the strategic direction of the business. Right. Um, are you comfortable telling me how many people are involved in the running or these are, are, are involved in the financial side of virtual rail fan? Um, I, I think we're going to keep that confidential. Okay. But, uh, you know, there it's a. Uh, yeah, we're going to keep that confidential yeah. for the moment. Mike's asked that he doesn't want me to share sure. exactly that kind of information. Don't you think these interviews, that's the one thing I've, uh, I don't know if you heard in when we were talking when you were in the green room, but that's the one thing I've found uh, with you is that I don't really have any trouble interviewing you. 
even with hardball questions, because I'll just simply say, you know, do you feel comfortable sharing X, Y, and Z? And you never have any problem saying, well, no, I don't think I'm going to tell you that, but I will tell you this, which I think is mm-hmm. what makes the interviews work so well. Well, I try to be an open book, but, you know, there's some things that, that you just can't share. Well, sure, of course. Unfortunately. Uh, well, and I, that's a discussion. that's a discussion that we've had in the past, which absolutely fascinates me, is uh, like, I don't think how you run your business is any of mine, but it seems like in the model railroad world, <laughs> how you run your business, there's a lot of people, it seems to be the answer is how you run your business is my business. Mm-hmm. Hear and, that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I often think to myself, is it your personality that you're, that you're, uh, you know, you come across as very friendly or is it, is it, is it the industry? Because I've made it pretty clear to anybody like my, my, like my employees or, or other people that might be near my or close to my business. And right now I have like uh, 12 employees. My son's involved now and he's making the company grow, which actually kind of irritates the crap out of me. Cause I had it down to a nice small manageable size. And, uh, but you know, I've always made it clear to the employees, it's none of your business. <laughs> How I run my business and what I do with it is none of your business, unless I'm not paying you. And uh, I, I, I'm fascinated how in model railroading, all, a, a large majority of model railroaders seem to think that your business is their business. I think it's because people have such a passion for the hobby and everybody wants you know, there's a million different things we could make and everybody wants their, their widget, whatever it is, their locomotive or their freight car. And, and, you know, and I understand that. I mean, there's a, I've always wanted to, there's a, the Chicago and Eastern Illinois Railroad's got this uh, streamline Pacific that I've always wanted the Dixie Flagler. And it's kind of my passion. It'll never happen. I mean, we, I know we'd never make money on it, but I think that passion kind of comes through and, and in today's internet world, it's pretty easy to share your opinion. <laughs> especially if there's something uh, with a product that somebody deems to be incorrect or whatever. They have no, no fear jumping on behind their keyboard and spewing all sorts of hatred out. And I think that's the hard part of the business too, because you know we put our heart and soul into everything that we do. And, and you you work on a project like a new locomotive and it takes three years to bring to market and, and you make that product announcement and then it's not what somebody wants. And suddenly folks are on the bandwagon and, but, you know, it's the nature of the beast. It's just sad because it does infect employee morale sometimes. So we try to keep our team off of the Facebook groups and the forums and that. Because, you know, overall, and I think it's important, we're doing, you're going to see me step back a little bit from doing so many shows and, and getting more of our team out on the road. Because I think it's important for them to be able to see that 99% of the comments are really positive and uplifting. And it's always good to hear that from the customer. Um, a lot of times what we see on the web or, or comes back, um, you know, like product support, well, they only get involved most times when folks are having a problem, right? So they only hear the, the negative side. They don't get to hear as much of the positive side. Um, okay. So let's kind of get to the elephant in the room. The main reason uh, you called me and the main reason, one of the reasons you and I could have a, uh, have a discussion on a, on a regular, what, how, why don't you text me when you do finish one of your legs of your or traveling around the world with your fifth wheel. That was your job. Your job was to tell me, okay, we're going to be here. Let's do another podcast. I failed. Um, I'll tell you what, this summer road trip was the hardest one we've done yet. Uh, from a time management perspective, I fell way behind. It took me two months after getting home um, just to get my emails cleaned up from the summertime. So, uh, I mean, I, I failed. It was bad. And, and we, uh, unfortunately, and we're getting ready to go back out again and we're going to try to get, this is crazy. Um, we're going to try to get, we have 26 States left and that includes Alaska and Hawaii. We're going to try to finish up 24 of those, uh, by this summer. Um, our daughter and son-in-law are going to have our first grandbaby and my wife is going to, uh, take, stay home and, and, uh, take care of the baby while they work and, so uh, we got to get the the road trip kind of wrapped up so that uh, she can get off the road. You haven't done the Northeast yet, have you? Not yet. Uh, that'll happen probably in late April or May. 
Um, I'm looking forward to that because I'm hoping to hook up with you somewhere along the way on that. Um, That'd be great. Uh, and are you, can can you handle this? Can you handle this, Shane? Can you text me somewhere along the way when you feel like you have a moment and we could do a little? Take your headset with you and your laptop, and it'll be interesting for people to hear what's uh, what's going on on the big uh, the big road trip. We may have to have Michelle drive, and I'll sit in the passenger seat with my laptop and the headset on <laughs> because. I think this trip, I thought the summer trip was busy. I mean, our typical day, you know, we get up and uh, we'll work until it's checkout 11 or so local time. And then we'll drive all afternoon, maybe into the evening, get to where we're going, set up the RV, do some more work, uh, get up the next day. And then we'll, I'll try to stay caught up with work, do the meet and greet that night and then do it all over again. So uh, I had a real hard time keeping caught up this past summer. There was, a lot going on um, internally in the business and uh, but uh, maybe she's been driving more and uh, uh, so I'll put her behind the wheel and we can do this while we're rolling. Um, uh, you guys turn your cameras off if you know how to do that. There you go. Let me turn the camera off. You don't yeah. want to see my ugly mug? Not really. I don't blame you. I don't really. <laughs> I find that honestly, you're a wonderful man and uh, we've enjoyed many happy times together, but you're pretty hard to look at. Seriously. I, I've got a face for radio. What can I say? There you go. Um, all right. Let's get to uh, the elephant in the room. The, one main, the main reason we wanted to have this discussion, because I do have some opinions, although I am each one I think I'm going to preface. Um, so we did a, this show called Retail Wars, and it was uh, we had Stephen Atwell from uh, Midwest Model Railroad in uh, Independence, Missouri, who runs a very successful shop. And uh, him and his dad started it some 10, 12 years ago, and now they've got like 18,000 square feet of space. Now, the only thing you need to know about those guys is the AML souvenir shop, the merchandise shop, used to be on the navigation bar on the main part of the the uh, website. And, mm-hmm. after, and they got so busy in so many departments, they took us down, and now we're just under other, <laughs> which I'm not particularly chuffed about. And I and I continually make a I continually point that out to Stephen. Now he has <laughs> he has some goofy little picture of me sitting be, on a, at a desk beside a couch, but it's like no, I want to be in the navigation bar. You're the official guy that's distributing our uh, our merchandise. Put us in the navigation bar. Um, and the other guy was our buddy, a young fella. Uh, both these guys are young. They're they're below. They're under forty, I think. I'm pretty sure Stephen's not forty yet. Um, and the other fellow is uh, Lauren James from Otter Valley Railroad in uh, Tilsonburg. Tilsonburg, Tilsonburg. My back still aches when I hear that word. Um, it, which is uh, roughly two hours west of Buffalo and two hours east of Detroit. So he's in a really good location. So while these guys were on the air, somehow the subject of scaled trains came up. And they don't like you. <laughs> let me be blunt see if i can put this in a way that you would understand mm, let me think uh, yeah that's it they don't like you and primarily the best way i think that i think the reason they don't like you primarily is because they don't get the chance to sell your product and from there uh some uh what's the word animus no what's the word animosity word? animosity has grown so I wanted to give you the because you were pretty disappointed about what some of the things that were said about you or scale trains. And like I said, you and I, you know me well enough that, hey, if you want to come on and say your piece, you're more than welcome to. So where are we at with that? Like, first off, what is it you wanted to say to the vast AML listening audience? Well, you know, I don't want to delve too deep into exactly what happened in those conversations because i have no problem talking about why uh, we've chosen the path that we have for selling to retailers but i don't want to single anyone out i don't think that's fair to those folks especially because they're not in a part of this conversation um but i i was pretty disappointed that in the way that that conversation was led and, and and went uh down the road because you and i have known each other for as you've said about 10 years now and you know my character and, and who I am and the company that we are. And uh, the thing, there was one thing in particular that didn't sit very well with me. Um, I would never disparage a retailer. 
Uh, and, and I'm smart enough to know that anything I say to a retailer's employee is going to get right back to that particular retailer. And, uh, and that's all I'm going to say on that particular topic. But uh, if we want to talk in general about, um, you know, our philosophy, our business philosophy there and where we're going, I'm happy to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I firmly believe in taking the high road and, and that's the direction I think that's, that's best because, you know, us as a manufacturer, we could talk about the details in particular. And the only thing we're going to do is make ourselves look bad and it's going to look like sour grapes. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd much prefer to talk about where we're going and, and, and our business philosophy. Well, well, absolutely. And I just wanted to give you the opportunity basically to say that if that's what you chose to say, because you're right. Like, I don't know you as anything other than a decent guy. Did I say anything that was derogatory towards you on that podcast? I don't remember because I don't remember any podcast, but if did I? Uh, I? I wouldn't say that it was derogatory towards me. It's just the way that the conversation was guided. It lo- It seemed like it was trying to come to a negative, uh, something that could be said that was negative. Uh, but I don't want to dwell on that because that's that's not uh, that's not future and forward looking, and that's where I prefer to be. Well, for sure. But I do also want to, uh, if I if I said anything derogatory or or hurt your feelings or anything like that, I want to at least on the air apologize to you because while I can be an extremely annoying individual, <laughs> <laughs> which by the way is an art that's been crafted over decades. You know, like it's you don't wake up one morning, you're you're an annoying individual. It's a craft that you have to work on. Um. So yeah. So it's important to me that if I said something that you felt was rude or derogatory, you know, I would want you to tell me even on the air because I I make a point of on the podcast my the, what I do on the podcast is I don't hide nothing because if I made a mistake, hey, I'll own up to it and uh, blah blah blah. So. We can go on well, I, from go. Yeah, go I appreciate that, but let's. Yeah, I'd rather just move on. Sure. Yeah. Good. Okay. So then I got a hardball question for you. Sure. Um. So okay, retailers can't buy your product, and what I hear um, not all we do sell to some retailers who've been with us since the beginning. Just let me offer that. Sure. And and as I remember the way you've told me the story, when you first started the business, you you went around looking for retailers that would sell your product, and mm-hmm. a lot of them didn't even want to hear from you. That's correct. And then uh, after that, you guys decided, well, we're not going to cut off the retailers that that decided to join us, but we're not mm-hmm. taking, but we're not taking any more on. That's correct. Right. So I think where the problem lies, or not a problem. It's not a problem because it's none of my business. I say I say that over and over and over. It's not a problem because it's none of my business. How you run your how you run your business or your affairs. It's none of my business. But as a podcaster and somebody who talks to all sorts of people, uh, the one problem I have seen or feel that there's something that could be discussed or you could discuss it, I think it would, would be ideal for you to explain it, is that I think some of the retailers, like I, I think the basic of the problem is your stuff is really cool. People want it. And retailers are frustrated because they can't sell it. And some customers are frustrated because they can't go in the store and pick up the latest and greatest scale trains, uh, this or that. Does that make mm-hmm. any sense? Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. And, and you know, and I think that's where, where the, the challenge lies uh, or the difficulty lies. We understand that, that retailers have customers, some have some customers that are coming in and asking for our product and maybe even showing that dealer, you know, their purchases or telling them what they bought from us. And that retailer's missing out on an opportunity to make a sale. And I, and I could, you know, being someone who's been on the retail side of the house, I can certainly see where that would be frustrating. Uh, and, and, and having to tell your customer that you can't supply them the product that they're wanting to buy. Um, now we have added somebody to the uh, it's uh, so far it's, we started out with me, Lionel, and then we had Bruce, the uh, um, mailboy, and we've added uh, a fellow that we refer to as Mr. Jingles, and his, his name is David Hyde. And the reason I invited him to join us midstream is because, what's the overall size of your layout there, David? About 12 by 22, double deck. So it's, it's in a one-car garage. So the reason we have I invited you to join us is because for a 12 by 22 foot uh, layout, uh, you probably have... Mm, 
conservatively speaking, about 40 times more locomotives than you need. <laughs> at least, <laughs> at least. And, and do you own any scale trains products? I have uh, the finger rack cars and uh, the air slide hoppers, uh, the Katy. I'm a Katy modeler. Shane and I have met many times. I don't have any uh, scale trains locomotives yet. He knows which one I'm going to ask him for. I probably don't even need to, to mention it. But I'm going to guess a Katy 40-2. Uh, that's correct. It yep, won't be SD too long. That's going to happen. Okay, excellent. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm pleased to be here. I, I do have one question. Uh, this kind of tails it's, into what Lionel was talking about. It's not time for your question yet. Okay. That's and fine. I didn't say Go you ahead. could ask questions. <laughs> I'll sit here. <laughs> <laughs> no, ask your question and we'll see where the conversation goes from there. <clears throat> well, my concern is just where the hobby is moving. Uh, so many of the manufacturers are doing direct sales now and we're seeing uh, these large established uh, retailers uh, closing like MB Kleins and moving. Uh, we're seeing uh, our our options dwindle locally. Uh, luckily in Dallas, we have a very good retailer. They don't stock uh, scale trains, um, uh, but and that was their I'm, choice, by the way. Th- yeah, and 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 I know that. Uh, yeah, they declined uh, when we first started. But I guess, and you probably get this question a lot. It it, it do you feel like this is going uh, long term? Uh, this model, this business model is going to uh, adversely affect the hobby as far as being able to uh, order everything you need at once. Uh, you know, when you're building a layout, you you spend so much money on things that you never see, like wiring and, and, mm-hmm. and wood and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, when you're detailing a layout, you want to be able to uh, build build a rapport with your preferred retailer. And I, I will preface my my uh, conversation here saying that I buy from all over the country and really North America. I just put a huge locomotive order in with uh, Otter Valley for some Rapido locomotives. So, you know, I, I look around, I'm, I'm careful. I do have a kind of a core uh, group of retailers that I use, but um, cause we're all price conscious of course, but at the same time, you know, when I need something, I like to be able to go uh, over to Addison uh, in Dallas and pick up what I need for my layout when I'm doing something in the middle of the day. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm just curious what, what your take is on that as far as is this long term going to be detrimental to the hobby or is this something that you think most retailers are going to go to where we're we're cutting out the distributor to the retailer model? Let's kind of back up the picture a little bit. And look at how retailing has changed over the last 20 years, not just in the hobby, but overall. You know, you look at where's Toys R Us today. You look at where Sears is at today. uh, And then you look at something like Amazon. And the world's really changed in how people buy product. I mean, you even touched on it yourself. It's not just your local retailer you're buying from north of the border as as well as some other places across the country. Anything can be picked, packed, and shipped today. and the thing about the model that we're in, you know, we were we tried very diligently in the beginning to have a very strong retailer network and worked hard at it for a year and a half. We had a thousand over a thousand retailers on our pursuit list and couldn't get folks to come on board. So the only ch- the only choice we had at that point is because we had our, our life savings invested in this is we had to really work on the direct model and it worked. And, and the big thing that I see is the, what the direct model allows us to do is a couple of things. You know, first of all, I was in distribution for 23 years and really saw how retailing changed, how retailers went from, uh, and, and I'm speaking in general terms, I'm not saying this is every dealer, but how um, retailer, many retailers went from having product on the shelf to just wanting to special order product or just pre-order product. And it's like, well, shoot, we can do that. Folks can go to our website or call us. And we can handle that and we can pick back and ship. The the big deal is it really increased the profit margin to the point today that if if we um, tried to shift our business back to the retail side of the house and the margin loss that we would be looking at, our our we would have to increase so significantly the company. And I'm, I use Atherton as a comparison because I know what we were doing back then. We would have to be a company that's significantly larger than Atherton just to be able to offset the margin loss. And it's that margin, you know, 
what uh, Lionel alluded to a little earlier about acquisitions. It's that margin that helps you do that. It's that margin that helps you invest in new tooling, things like an SD45X or an SDL39 or, or you know, even things more mainstream. And that and it works for us and it's worked really well. I can understand the concern about being able to go and purchase local. I mean, I'm, I'm a modeler myself, uh, but even for me, the nearest store that's going to have anything uh, that I would need that's every day is a two hour drive. So while I understand it, retail has changed. And I think we have to evolve with that, the way we retail or otherwise we will become the Toys R Us or the Sears and be left behind. That's a great explanation. Can, can I, uh, can I, uh, um, do I take from your, your discussion about in the early days you, you went out to like a thousand different retailers and people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't jump on board. Did your, did your business idea of buying direct that like you didn't have that idea until people started turning you down? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? No, we actually, from the very beginning, we knew that we weren't going to sell through wholesale distribution at traditional wholesale prices. And we knew that we wanted to have a retailer segment and we wanted to have a consumer side as well. And one of the things that we did, and we and we still do to this day, um, you know, customer likes to think they're getting a deal. And so we have a retail price. We discount 20% off that price. And that's the selling price on our website. And I think some retailers, there were two problems, two big issues in the beginning. I think some retailers had difficulty in embracing that particular pricing model. But when you looked at what the large internet resellers were selling product for at that time, if a dealer matched those internet resellers, they were making the same margin. It's just that we were establishing the street price instead of allowing that large uh, internet retailer to to establish that street price. Uh, And that was one. And the second thing was, there was, um, how do I say this? There was, I heard this a lot. I'll say it this way. And, and from people that I knew really well that had known for years that uh, from dealers that would say, you know what, you're going to build your business on our backs and then you're going to pull the rug out from under us like it's happened to us before and sell direct. And I'm like, guys, you know, some of these guys, I'm like, you know me, you know who I am, you know my how I, you know, my morals and my ethics. If I tell you this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to yank the rug out from under you. And I think the proof is in the pudding. We have dealers that have been with us since day one. As long as they continue to support us and carry and stock our products, that we, you know, they'll continue to be able to have access to our products. We have no plans to go away from the folks that are with us. We just don't have plans to add anybody new. And so how do you feel like, like it, it would uh, as a as a as a uh, purchaser, I would like to be able to go into my you know if I go in into see into Lauren James store, Otter Valley, or if I go into uh, Atwell store. These are the only two stores that I because I don't go into that many stores anymore. But okay, like uh, as a guy, I'd like to go in and see the latest scale trains stuff, mm-hmm. and. As a re- and as a purchaser, I'm kind of like, well, the only way you get to see it in person is if you go to a show, and if there's no shows around, like I mean, I happen to, but uh, like, do you f- do, do you think that basically retail model railroad retailing is just going to go the way of the dodo bird, or or if it's not, like, how do you you guys must sit around and talk about? Okay, we don't think that model railroad retailing is going to go the way of the dodo bird, but we're only in 20% of the shops. Like does, are, do you, do you guys have that discussion where you're constantly trying to figure out how do you expose yourself to the general public? Well, the, that's, you, that's you're right. Sad. There are folks who like to, to shop in store and we understand that we're missing that segment, but I also believe that's a small segment. When you look at, at what, uh, what, um, Dave said earlier about having multiple outlets across the country and and in Canada, I think a lot of modelers shop that way. And while, you know, we may be missing the newcomer, we're working on an ambassador program. I think that will help us with that. And that should come out within the next year. And, you know, you look at what we can do on web today with photography, what we're able to do with video, you look at Facebook, while you're not able to physically touch the product um, before you buy it, the good news is people, we have a reputation now 
uh, of delivering high quality, highly detailed product. Folks know what they're going to get when they buy from us. And if, and if you do have an issue, we have a full-time service department that's, that's absolutely happy to help and get folks taken care of. And I think that's one of the big reasons for virtual rail fan, right? Is because we can now reach out to a much broader audience than just the model railroad community to expose those folks, not just only to our brand, but to our hobby, which benefits everybody. Yeah, that's very cool that you bought virtual rail fan and you understand. See, that's what I think model railroading is going to do. I think it's just going to become stuff like uh, scale trains buying virtual rail fan and, and turning it into like, like I think what people don't understand and maybe, maybe I, I don't like to blow my own horn, but maybe I understand it because I've been self-employed basically my whole adult life from the age of 25 and I really didn't become an adult until 45. But uh, like if you can generate a lot of uh, capital, it only helps you create more exciting things to do for the consumer. Mm-hmm. That's right. I think that's probably one of the things that the Joe average consumer doesn't understand is like, okay, you buy virtual rail fan and you figure out a way to generate a whole pile more capital. Well, now you're going to be able to plow it back into other, other ideas that you have, which is going to give people even more fun to be in the hobby. And you touched on something there, Lionel, that the, we are actually going to develop, I'll call them products, but they won't be traditional things that you would think of traditionally as model railroad products for the virtual rail fan channel. Uh, because there'll be things in the, that have a more real railroading flair to them that'll appeal to a much broader audience. And those things will generate the revenue and, and the profits to, to plow back into scale trains. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, um, you were talking about running a business and making money in model railroading. and I'll tell you what, this has the, been the biggest challenge of my life. We have nearly 30 employees now between the two companies and cash flowing this business is mind blowing. Uh, when you're talking about locomotives that you'll invest a quarter million dollars in HO to just to bring to market 150,000 and in, you know, I just signed off on the first freight car last week. That's going to cost us over a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand for tooling there's literally millions at play at any given moment. And it takes a tremendous amount of uh, profit uh, to be able to continue to fund all of those new projects or to be able to make acquisitions or, you know, invest in virtual rail fan or invest in scale trains or whatever the next big thing is. But the idea is we're trying to be forward thinking and, and not be the the Sears or the Toys R Us. We want to be that cutting edge, I don't, I don't say I, I can't really compare us to Amazon. I mean, they're on a level that not, I'm not sure any of us could ever dream of. But, you know, I've challenged our team. I'm like, what could we do to become a household name like Lionel? Um, and I think and when I say that, that's very bold. I don't want to say that to boast. It's just a challenge to how do we get the exposure um, out there so folks know who Scale Trains is. Uh, I'm wondering, I guess, just to follow up with my question, I think for the consumer and for someone that spent a lot of money in the last five years on a layout. It, I have no problem ordering direct from the manufacturer for locomotives, uh, cars, uh, rolling stock, any of that stuff. Uh, the issue is I'm worried as, as someone that, you know, if I'm, I'm working on my layout, I'm doing a scene and I run out of static grass or ballast or something simple, small KDs Mm -hmm. or, you know, wheel sets. Um, I'm worried long term that, you know, we're going to have to order everything online, wait a week to get something. And, and a lot of people already do that. I know that or across the country, like you said, you're two hours away from a decent, uh, train store. Mm-hmm. I'm lucky enough. We have one here. I'm just worried long-term about the hobby. If, if we start doing that, some of the, the joy of the hobby is waking up in the morning. Maybe you have a son and you and your son go to the hobby store. You pick up the supplies for that day and then you build a scene or you're working on a scene for that day. And I think that's, that's my concern as, as a very savvy consumer, because I do look around, I do price compare. I I check prices quite a bit and, you know, I have no problem ordering direct from scale trains. My concern is, 
is are we going to completely have to order you know all of our woodland scenics products online and our wheel sets and is it going to come to that uh, at some point and and you you mentioned you know these many these uh, retailers have to be very savvy and i think the ones that are surviving and thriving and i know lionel has talked about this on his podcast are the ones that have a large internet presence mm -hmm. which which both of those do midwest and otter valley um you know and of course my local hobby shop which is a great hobby shop but they don't have an internet presence so uh, i'm i'm just curious you know in you don't have to answer this because it's it's really you know it's not really down your lane completely but i'm just worried about being able to go and get what i need because hobby town usa is not going to stock what we need you know it's not going to have a large train section uh that you would have at a dedicated HO or N scale, uh, train store. And, and I certainly understand that concern. And, and we don't believe that all hobby stores, you know, it's not like they're just going to evaporate and go away that you look at the larger retailers. You mentioned the ones with the, with the large internet presence there. I believe they'll, they're going to continue to thrive and continue to grow. It's what we saw even before I left horizon was you saw the, the smaller mom and pop store, not to say that all of them, but, um, uh, folks who didn't have that presence, there's some that thrive. You know, you mentioned your retailer there in the Dallas Metroplex. I mean, they're doing just fine, but uh, you, you look at some of these others and they're they're struggling because they don't have the the base of customer to be able to support the store. And that's why the internet's been such a, a big deal for a retailer. And, and the idea is, right, you know, you take that internet retailer, we can service the customer just as well as any re internet retailer. So why don't we just handle that ourselves? And that's how we came to that conclusion. And yeah, but I, I, I can see David's point to agree as said, you know, and particularly my kind of agent, Lionel Sage and others that, uh, it used to, like David touched on, it used to be a big thing. And I can remember when I, uh, you know, back in the eighties, uh, Saturday mornings, I go down to the local hobby shop in Edmonton and there'd be a bunch of other guys from the club down there. We'd hang around and shoot the breeze and, talk to people who came in and, you know, answer questions and help the guy run, you know, if somebody had a question, you know, I'll talk to Bill over there. He knows how to fix that for you. And, you know, the guy would come over and talk to Bill and get his problem solved and, you know, life went on its merry way. But, you know, unfortunately that is becoming more and more of a, a day way gone by that, uh, you know, I don't think we'll ever see back again, but it kind of deprives people of that uh, that interaction that, uh, you know, is, uh, I, I think was a good thing. Uh, I have two points on that. One, I'm going to defend our buddy Shane, Shane here. And one I'm going to disagree with him on first off, uh, it's not Shane's problem that hobby shops are disappearing. He's not single handedly ruining the hobby shop industry just because scale trains won't sell to, uh, don't, uh, don't venture out to find new hobby shops. It's just the new world. I mean, it's... That's oh, exactly, yeah. It's, Absolutely, it's, yeah. The, the, the world has changed that way. Yeah, and... It's, and Everything's bought online. Yeah, everything's bought online. I mean, yeah, everything. I bought a new seat for my golf cart online. You know, it's like... <laughs> and the thing comes in a, you know, a two-foot by four-foot box, and, you know, somebody drops it off at your door two days later, and it's like, well, I didn't need the seat two days ago, so it's not really that important that it takes two days to get here. And so I think it's really, really important... And I know you guys don't disagree with me, but for everybody that's listening, I think it, it's really, really important that it, uh, Shane, Shane Wilson is not the big bad uh, bear coming in to ruin everybody's model railroad experience. It's just that he came to, he came to the game when the world was changing. And so he happened to show up, you know, it's just like in hockey now, I mean, they hardly have fights anymore because everybody's six foot four and skates at a hundred miles an hour and the game changed and he just happened to show up when the game changed. So yeah, I would stick to my original point. I would like to go into Otter Valley or Midwest uh, model railroad and be able to look at the latest uh, scale trains, locomotives or cars or whatever. I would really, really like that, but that's not the way it's going to work. Because Shane has, as any good businessman would, has found a way to make even more money. Now, the other side of the coin that I would say, that I would say to manufacturers, and Shane talked about, you know, how much tooling costs and how much this costs and how much that costs. 
as a customer, I don't care. It's a business. You're making money. You know, how much it costs you to fly to China and get to, uh, tooling? I don't care. If you don't, if, if it, if you need a lot of cash flow to run your business and you can't handle it, well, then I would highly recommend you should stop because that's just the way it is in the big world is that, you know, it costs money to run a business and we don't need to hear about it. But the other side of that coin is we also need to accept the fact that uh, Scale Trains runs a good business. They're making a fabulous product. And if this is the way they choose to sell it, so be it. You know, I think, I think, I think too many people think their opinions matter. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a funny, it's a funny thing, you know, like it's a, it's not like the podcast where people have the opportunity to write in their pros and cons about the podcast and we're happy to read them pro or con. I think it's just the world has changed so much. It's like me, uh, you know, beating on the NMRA about, you know, the way they want to, the way they're going to sell their product is not by telling them that, you know, a top dead center of the second stroke, it's 11.8 compression the thing that's going to sell it is fellowship, 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 period, end of sentence. And, you know, that's basically what Shane's trying to do in scale trains as, as, uh, you know, as, as repeatal trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. If it's L, if it's H O, the fast track is repeatal. I know for a fact that Jason enjoys uh, running his business and he tries to do it. And these two, Shane and Jason are, are are friendly, but they're not. Neither one of them are turning to the other guy, and going. So, what do we do tomorrow? What do you think we should do tomorrow? Each guy has his own plan, and each guy has his own dreams and directions that they want to go. Did any of that make sense? I think it's well, well said, yeah. and and you are right. Retailing has changed, and you are right, and and, and a point well taken that. Uh, you know, business does take money to run and, and that's just the name of the game. And, and, uh, you know, and it, but it is the, the piece of that puzzle is it is the profitability that allows those things to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, because that's because what I, you're not a nonprofit organization because that doesn't pay the bills, uh, and, and keep you and others gamefully employed if you're not making profit. That's I think, right. I think if we, if we make one good point from this particular episode of a modeler's life, uh, uh um, is that if you don't generate, if you're not a really well-run company and scale change doesn't generate a good amount of expendable capital, then they're not going to do a whole lot of cool things that you, that people are going to benefit from down the road. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and really the crux of this particular podcast and the reason we're having it is there's some retailers that aren't happy that they can't sell, sell scale change product. And it's unfortunate, but Shane has found a way to run his business at a most at the most profitable way. And it sounds to me like we're all going to benefit from it in the end. So, you know, we need to adjust and react. I think that's it. All comes down to we have to do what's best for our business, and the retailer has to do what's best for their business. Absolutely, and and I'm sure Shane, I I I don't speak for you, but if some plan is somewhere down the line, some retailer came up with a plan where every where you guys could could work together and it made sense, you'd be like all over it. I would be, but boy, I'll tell you, it, it would really have to show us how we could supplant the margin without giving up control of our brand and how our brand is marketed and sold. Okay. Now I'm going to change the subject because I'm going to bitch at you about something else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you've bought virtual rail fan. You've bought a controlling interest in virtual rail fan. I'm actually talking to you pretty excited about what it might become and some of the, the what you're talking about, some of the other things that you're going to do. I think that's mm-hmm. very, 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 very cool. And one of the things you guys have done now is that you can buy or you can rent or own uh, a certain videos. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of them are from Green Frog uh, Productions. And there's just a little, I'm a customer saying this, it's a little uh, bugaboo of mine. Uh, one of our regular AML uh, folks that's on the show quite a bit, his name is Chris Wayman. Mm-hmm. And he has actually produced two or three or four dozen, dozens of these Green Frog videos that you see. But, and, but in the description for these products, they don't mention who the original author is. And I don't understand that. Like I'm looking at the one that's uh, 
hang on here. Let me get, let me work the, the Google. It's uh, CSX3 Nashville to Louisville. I don't know if this is one he made, but in the description, it doesn't say who the original videographer was, whether it was Chris or whether it was somebody else. And I think you guys are dropping the, dropping the, what do you say? Dropping the, dropping the ball, dropping the ball on this one, because I think each one of these descriptions should also have uh, a Chris Wayman video or whoever did it, because uh, I think in videos, in the history of uh, videos, especially Green Frogs, which I've been buying forever, I would like to see who the original uh, videographer was. So that's uh, uh, nit- I'm nitpicking on that particular subject. That's all right. Um, that- I wasn't familiar with that, but I'll take that feedback back. Yeah, write that down, because I think that's a really good point. I will. Because uh, we've, we're recording this uh, about two weeks ahead of uh, Springfield. It won't come out until after Springfield. But Shane, when I come over to interview you at Springfield, do you know what one of the points is that I'm going to make? You're going to ask me if I followed up on this. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or investigated it or going to do something about it or whatever. Actually, you know what I think we should do is uh, I think we've pretty much, uh, Shane, do you feel like you were able to say what it is you wanted to say? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think what would be really cool is if we combine this uh, recording with uh, the Springfield recording, because it's usually like 10 or 15 minutes, and then we've got ourselves a show, and we'll call it the uh, Shane Wilson Variety Hour. <laughs> well, I don't need all the credit. You give the credit to Scale Trains, because it's this is definitely a team effort. It's well, not we, just me. Okay, let's uh, just investigate that for a minute so everybody understands what, what the pecking order is. Because I think, for me, I understand that you're the president of the company. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming you're the guy that's in charge. I am. Well, I like <laughs> most days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so scale trains may be responsible for it, but as far as I can tell, you're scale trains. Just like there's a whole lot of folks that help me with the AML podcast. It's very, very popular, and mostly because I'm a, I have a winning personality. Uh, but, uh, it's very, very popular. There's folks like David Hyde and Bruce and, uh, a fellow named Kelly and the table master and the queso cowboy and hard part. We got all kinds of folks that help us, but at the end of the day, if it all goes, uh, a uh, hairwire, people are going to be pointing the finger at me. And I'm pretty much, uh, I'm assuming that's pretty much the way it works at scale trains. Uh, I, you know, it is, and it isn't, we actually have a really strong team of, of senior leadership and, uh, we all really work closely together in the future vision and, and how we do things. So um, there's a lot of folks carrying the load. Hmm. Maybe that's what we need is some uh, vision. Hey, guys, maybe that's what we need is a team of visionaries. We need a vision board. Yeah, we need a vision board. Yeah, visionaries. But we turn the cameras off, so how can we have a vision board? There you go. We can't see it. We can't see it, just like your makeup. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, I'm only, I only said, the problem here is, David, and I understand you're not uh, familiar with any arm of show business. Um, and this... <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> but when we're on the air, I try to make it seem as if we're professional. Okay. okay. I'll wear my tuxedo next time. Yeah. yeah why don't you? Um, I, I think that's it. Do, have we, do, we not, do we all agree that this is a good way to do it? We'll stop here. And then we'll uh, add, a, add on the Springfield segment. And then, Bruce, you and I will do a little intro and outro. We can do that. And then we will have created a pretty interesting uh, podcast, I think. I believe you are correct. Okay, so the next thing you're going to hear after this, uh, we're going to need you to do something in a minute, Shane. But the next thing you're going to hear after this is the interview from Springfield. And there's people milling around and Shane looks like he's about to fall over from being tired and blah, blah, blah. And I'll lead in with some softball questions. You know, hey, this looks cool, and he's introducing this, and we're talking about the hypotypical stuff, and yada, yada, yada. And then I'm going to go, so, uh, Shane, I understand now that uh, Scale Trains owns a a majority portion of a share of uh, Virtual Railfin. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll go, so anyways, what I think should be done is these videos should have, the videographers should have credit. What do you think about that, Shane? Do you need me to? Do you want me to write that down, Shane, or do you think you'll be able to remember when we get there? I wrote that down. Oh, out of boy, out of boy. This was good. So you, I assume you got some big announcements for your Springfield. Yeah, we've got quite a bit going on. We have uh, the next all new HO four axle um, that we'll be announcing. 
Ooh, and then yes. uh, our next all new N scale locomotive and an all new N scale freight car with uh, a feature I believe that's never been done before and in. And then uh, we'll announce our first exact rail freight car that we're going to do a pre orders on uh, that uh, PO hasn't been placed with the factory yet. And then we'll unveil the first five CSX heritage units as well. Nice. Well, that's cool. It's great. Yeah, we got Can't a lot wait of- to see that four axle. Can't wait to see that four axle. Yeah, well, uh, me too. Samples uh, shipped uh, this morning, so fingers and toes are crossed that they get here in time. <laughs> um, now, when you're uh, in the booth and you spend a lot of time in the booth, and uh, if there's a guy that wanders over and he introduces himself as Brad Williamson, mm-hmm. uh, I don't need to explain to you the particulars, but if I was you, I would just either A, call security, or B, just, you know, excuse yourself from the booth altogether. Okay. Nice guy. <laughs> nice guy. But, you know, the lights are flickering every above every floor from the third one up. So. <laughs> All right. I'll keep an eye out. <laughs> yeah. Do that, would you? <laughs> uh, okay, boys. I think we got her covered. Now, the only other thing we're going to do, because I like to be as transparent with the podcast as I possibly can. Uh I promised Shane because he wanted because we were t- we were talking about some p- uh, difficult subjects. I promised Shane that he would get to listen to this podcast before it was released, and we're going to stick to that because a promise is a promise, and I don't mind telling the uh, AML Nation that that's what's going to do. I don't think that we really had anything that that uh, you had a problem with, did we, Shane? No, I don't think so. No. But I'll let you listen to it anyways, because really, what what better way is there to go to sleep than listening to the lilty sounds of my voice as you nod off? Oh, boy, yeah, those just, will be sweet Just dreams. do not be driving or operating heavy machinery at the time. <laughs> I'll make sure I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, Shane, at the appropriate moment, uh, we need you to say Subway Chimes Go, because that's what we do from uh, from one segment to another. We have a recording of the Toronto Transit subway chime. Okay. And we need you to say it with enthusiasm. I can do that. All right. Go. Go now. I'll count you down. Three, two, one. Subway chimes go. Okay. So we've had our intermission from our uh, long interview. Now we've traveled to Springfield. And like a time warp. Like a time warp. And now we're here having uh, having an interview in front of your, right in front of the Scale Trains booth. That's right. What's new in the Scale Trains booth? Man, we have a lot to share. So we I'll do. give you a couple of industry things that happened while we're here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So really excited. The NMRA has announced that the 2026 National Convention and the train show is going to be in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, that's cool. So we'll be doing a special steam excursion. That's the plan if it all comes together. Yeah. At TVRM, and then we'll be uh, they'll be we'll be on the layout tours because we've got a couple of layouts in the office. And uh, man, I know there's a ton of things that Roy and the committee have got planned for 26. So more details soon on that one. That's kind of coming home to kind of coming home to our. Chattanooga was the headquarters for years. Chattanooga's still the headquarters, still there. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Jenny's still there. Saudi Daisy. Saudi Daisy. Yep. So TVRM is the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. Railroad Museum. I knew that. Yep. So we did that, and then uh, you know, last summer we acquired a stake in Virtual Rail Fan, and we yeah, call that's it, cool. We call it coupled with scale trains, and we announced yesterday, pretty exciting. We are reducing membership prices. Um, used to be sixteen ninety nine to twenty one ninety nine on the web. Now it's four ninety nine a month. So really, yeah. So we're going to four ninety nine. You still get all the cameras that we have. Uh, you also get uh, all the locations. So we're in over sixty locations, hundred plus cameras, and then uh, we made some announcements on what's coming in twenty four. So we'll have a new uh, TV app. So Roku, Fire Stick, Amazon TV. We'll have mobile. So for your tablet, your phone, and then uh, we'll also be adding new cameras. We'll be have our first four K locations this year. And a lot of hardware upgrades, and everything is custom built software for us. So, right. custom built software, hardware, and then the other cool thing is that um, we're really going to try and move more to the web. We'll still have YouTube. We're going to use that as a promotional vehicle, but all new cameras will be only on uh, on the website. And you, with the website, you get actually more benefits. So you get things like we have dashboard, so that you can watch up to nine locations at one time. You you know you can all set right. it up. Yeah, so yeah. You can do 
nine three streets. or six or yeah, nine, right, however right. you want to do it. And the cool thing is, you can let's say you're a BNSF fan, you could have it all BNSF, you could have, and save it. You could have all Amtrak and save it, and then you can go watch it anytime. And then we do uh, locations. That usually have two to three cameras, right? And so you can go to a location page, watch all those cameras in one spot, and then if you we call it Never Miss a Train. You can actually go back 10 days with the DVR. It's got a little thumbnail scrubber, <laughs> and you can actually see the train. You let go. The train goes by. Grab the scrubber. Go to the next thing. Wow, that's cool. So that's pretty cool. And then on the scale train side of the house, well, we actually get the before, product. Before we leave the virtual train fan, or okay. virtual rail, rail fan, fan uh, and now, again, as always, I ask you questions. You answer the ones you want. Don't answer the ones you don't want. What was it that made you think about that this was a good idea? So it's pretty amazing. Um Virtual Rail Fan is just up the road from where we live in Benton. Okay. Uh, they're in Athens. They were in Athens, Tennessee, they're now in our headquarters, but uh, not, not even 30 minutes apart. And shortly after we moved to Tennessee, I was at the local Model Railroad Club, was having a meeting for the NMRA, and, and Mike, a seer, one of the co founders, had come down and, and did a presentation. And I'm like, man, this is super cool. Yeah. I would love to own a part of this company. You know, he's talking about the numbers they're seeing on social, and that was like eight, nine years ago. Yeah. And then uh, Mike uh, came to me a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Actually, came to Bruce first in operations, and he's like, hey, you know, we've kind of got to a level where I'd like to be able to take care of our employees, but if I do that, I'm going to have to take a salary hit. And right. uh, he says, but I want to do that for our people. So, you guys got something? So Mike came in as our videographer. And uh, I was in his office back in the springtime, and Mike had mentioned that they have there's Mike and then Justin, and uh, and then there was a third person. And it was like a silent investor, and they meant, he mapped him just in passing, say, man, our silent investor, he uh, he really would like out of the business. I'd love to buy his shares. I really can't afford it. And uh, just a passing thing, and I looked at him and I said, well, Mike, we'd be interested thinking there's no way we can afford right, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Mike's like, are you serious? And I'm like, well, yeah. I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, this is crazy, but why not? Yeah. And, uh, well, you know, you think on YouTube that anybody who's got hundreds of thousands of followers or is making a bazillion dollars. That's right. not the truth. We got the financials, and it was like, wow, that's not nearly as big as I thought it was. You know, VRC's um, has 650,000 subscribers on YouTube, 850,000 unique visits a month, right. seeing close to 2 million views a month. Yeah. And uh, I was really surprised that when we got down to the brass tacks on the finances. And and uh, it's like, well, here's a vehicle that reaches, you know, 10 times what anything in our industry currently reaches. And so we can bring model trains to a whole new audience. Yeah. And, you know, you look at it's kid friendly. The chats are family friendly. Yeah. So anything from a small child all the way up to, you know, us old guys that want to watch trains. And we've got locations everywhere. And so the thought was, well, heck, you know, we can, not only can we bring scale trains to an audience, we can elevate our industry, and we, are, we will have products that are specific to the virtual rail fan channel. Um, and when I say that, I'm not talking like locomotives and freight cars, but things that a mom would buy, someone would buy as a gift, those sure, kind yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah. And we've got a whole new audience to sell to. So honestly, I believe virtual rail fan in the next five years will be a bigger company than scale trains. Wow. That's uh, that's so. Let me ask you this question, if I can figure out how to word it. Um, like part of our discussion in the earlier part of the interview was about you uh, selling, not selling to retailers. Mm -hmm. But you seem to have always had a, a grasp on the new world. It's kind of something I've always prided myself on. I like the podcast, and I know what you know. But you seem to have always had a grasp on the new world, the internet, selling direct, blah blah blah. What is it that you think pushed you in that direction? Because this thing with Virtual Rail Fan is kind of a no-brainer for somebody like you who runs their business based on the new world. So what do you think it was that kind of pushed you in that direction? Well, if you go back to my days at Atherton and Horizon, um, when, when the industry started to shift to the pre-order model, we really saw retailers start to shift their purchasing habits. It went from, I'm going to stock product in my store to, I'll order what I've got pre-sold. Okay. And then the retailers started, stopped carrying nearly the inventory. Well, when we started Scale Trains, it's like, look, we, we in this age of the internet, because it's totally grown in, the la you know, in our lifetimes, in the age of the internet, it's like, well, we can take an order. We yeah. can fulfill that order. Why don't we just do it? We can, because, you know, the one thing I saw is when when Horizon tried to tell their story 
it often didn't reach the end consumer because it, it was funneled through the retailer. Right. And for us, it's like we can tell our story straight to the person that's buying our product. Yeah. And by doing that, you know, that's really where the, the direct model came. And then when retailers wouldn't come on board in the early days, we had no choice. It's like our family livelihoods are at stake. Right. We've got to build the direct business. I mean, we always planned to be direct, but never thought it would be 70% of our business. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then as I look forward, you know, it, it, there's very valid points about new people getting started. How are you going to do that? We have plans for that, right? Sure. Of how we're going to have brand ambassadors. I can't share the details yet, but that's coming. And then you look well, at virtual. Tell everybody I'm going to yeah. be your brand ambassador. <laughs> You're going to be our brand ambassador. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and then with virtual rail fan, right? It's another chance to, to look outside the market because the thing I always say is we have to. We, uh, in my job, my role now. Thankfully, we've been really blessed to grow as a company. My job is to be out in front of our business. I'm, you know, we have a three-year production plan. We have a five-year new product plan, and. But I want to say I got to look down the road and say what's next. How do we keep involving our business? You know, we talked earlier. Don't want to be the next Sears or Kmart right. Or, right. or Toys R Us. How does retail evolving? And you have to stay in front of that so that you're evolving with it yeah. and your business continue to be conti- can continue. Well, that was tough to say together. Um, continue to be relevant, and that's that's the whole goal. You got to have that vision. Yeah, you got to have the and you got to embrace the new world. Like I mean, yep. You know, people complain about Facebook, but I mean, I've met, I've had some situations where I've met people that found me 30 years later. Yep. Yes, there's lots of bad stuff on the Facebook or on the internet, but you got to look past that and look for the good stuff far outweighs the bad stuff. Oh, yeah. As far as I'm concerned. And, you know, it's that social media that connects us, right? We have 60, believe it or not, 60,000 Facebook followers now. They're yeah, I can, yeah. Unbelievable. And to be able to communicate with those folks in a post yeah. and then be able to, to uh, post back if they make comments and, and share things. I mean, that's an unbelievable conduit. You've got to embrace that. Whether And then you look at what we're doing in Instagram and YouTube. and I mean, social's where it's at. Well, you know? look, at, look what we're doing here. Where the first part of the interview is you at home in Tennessee. I had uh, you know a couple other people on the interview. And then now we're doing it here at Scale Trains. I'm going to put it all together yeah. in Springfield. And I'm going to put it all together. And it's going to seem seamless. Right. It's going to be an interesting show. And it's like, that's a fun thing. If you don't... In- I love doing the podcast because I never thought it would grow to what it's grown to. Yep. For starters. And I mean, there's so much interesting stuff to do and ways to connect. And you just seem to have completely embraced that. Now with the virtual rail fan thing, it just seems like it's the whole package almost. Yeah. And, and the great thing is... I mean, it's the power of the numbers, right? I shouldn't even say this, but think about it. Our goal first year is 25,000 subscribers. Right. That means the VR's business will have grown exponentially in the first year from a revenue and profit standpoint. But think if we can continue to grow that number. Oh, what if sure. we got to 100,000 subscribers? Yeah. We actually have plans, multi-year plans, and this is crazy, but we think we can get to a million plus subscribers. That's a game changer, and the well, sure. and the idea there is not only does it help virtual rail fan, it helps scale trains, and a rising tide is, lifts all boats, as JFK exactly. would say. Yeah. And the money that will flow back into scale trains, holy cow! I mean, it, it's mind boggling the opportunities that that the, can the bring. The opportunities just grow on top of yeah. each other, and the industry as a whole. People, you know, I'll have this. I say this all the time. This hobby is going to absolutely explode, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe, maybe it'll be after I'm gone, but. As the generations go through and there are more people are exposed to this hobby, it's going to become more and more mainstream. It can't help but, and especially with things like you guys buying virtual rail fan and making it bigger. Because lots of people are interested in trains. They may, not be, they may not be 30 by 40 basement layout types, but they might be easily be shelf layout types. Well, you know, in a couple of weeks we go to uh, World's Greatest Hobby, right? And the whole like, goal of World's Greatest Hobby shows is to introduce families. Right. You know, We'll be in Indianapolis. Last time we were in India, I think we were close to 30,000 um, uh, visitors, guests for the show. Well, we uh, we flip-flop. We put Virtual Rail Fan on the front row because we don't really have a product right. that fits that that customer that's coming through, that potential customer coming through the door. But putting VR right out front, can you imagine mom, dad, kids? Yeah. Hey, mom, how about four ninety nine for a family-friendly environment? You don't have to worry about your kid. You, they can watch it. You don't have to worry about. And that's four ninety nine a month. Yeah, and that's yeah. four ninety a month. I mean, holy cow! And they can. And if the kid loves trains, and if you go to World's Greatest Hobby, you see young kids who absolutely love trains. So then the next step is how do we take that that young person and bring them into the hobby? Because you know, Lionel, it, 
if you get started as a youngster, <laughs> it's probably a lifelong hobby. Absolutely. You so, can't get out. So let's hook them and keep them. Yeah. And not only does that grow our business, it grows the industry, it grows everybody, and we get more people participating. And with me as your brand ambassador. Yeah, and even more people. <laughs> All right, that's it. We have now created a show that was, I feel like the only thing I did that irritated you in the first part was when you started talking about uh, how much molds cost. And now, in fairness to you, this is what I've been doing to the NMRA, because they started talking about the way they're going to sell it as standards and conformances. And I say, nobody cares. Nobody cares about the standards. You are not going to sell somebody on standards and conformances. And then we were talking about something on the first part of the show, and you started saying about what molds cost. And I'm like, nobody cares what it costs to run your business, right? Because you're running your business. That's, right. That's what it is. And it's kind of become a thing with all manufacturers. Well, it costs X number of dollars. And it's like, well, okay, then don't do it if it's too much for you. So I thought maybe I, if I did irritate you, then I apologize. But, you know, I do irritate you occasionally. No, no, you, not at all. I mean, you made a good point, right? It is the cost of doing business. But I also think, you know, folks in our, in our world have a very strong passion. Yeah. And, you know, even here this weekend at the show, we get asked, will you do this? Will you do that? Will you do the other thing? And, and there is an economic part to it where you'll get a request and someone's really passionate about that request and, and then they push you to say, will you do it? And it's like, man, we'd love to do it. But when you're investing the kind of money, there's no way, let's say, that we're going to be able to sell enough units yeah. to not only recover the tooling investment, but to even cover the unit cost and then let alone make a profit. So there That's is some true. validity to it. That's true. That's a good point. And if you don't explain it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And then nobody knows, right? Because I mean, I have people come up all the time, and you, you can make a locomotive for $50,000. Why aren't you pumping out locomotives all the time? And it's like, holy smokes, if we can make locomotives for fifty grand, we would be pumping out locomotives all the well, time. Well, that's an interesting part of this hobby. This will be the last thing I do. But it, it feels like the people who are the participants, rake the manufacturers, it's, like, it's none of their business. How much? It, but I can see where it's kind of like this yin and yang. Lots of people would come up not having any idea no. what it costs to re manufacture a freight car. Right. And yet, and so they're all over you. And yet you're wanting to say, well, do you understand how much this costs? <laughs> like, yeah. And, you know, and if somebody, somebody's really passionate and they really want to do it, you know, there's been opportunities where we've said, look, we'll do it. It'll, if you're willing to invest, we'll write a contract. Here's how the risk works. Well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And uh, we've gotten to a couple of times where we're coming down to the finish line, and it's time to put that name on there. And then folks are like, mm, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think I want to do that, right? Yeah, yeah so, exactly. All right. Well, this has uh, gone pretty well. This is the end. We don't um, want to talk about new product? Okay, go ahead. All right. Well, I'll make it quick. So we had uh, five product announcements, two in N-Scale. We announced an all-new N-Scale SD40T-2 tunnel motor. Right. And the cool thing is you can actually see through the radiator grills oh, in N-Scale. In N-Scale. Yeah. And we're, and we're doing, like, the Rio Grande's you can get Mars that actually operates, so that's pretty cool. We're doing an N-Scale uh, BNSF reefer. That's the one with the icicles on it. And uh, you can get it with or without sound, and it's track-powered. <laughs> And then uh, in HO, we're doing the Evans 4780 covered hopper. That's an exact rail car. Uh, that's our first one we're actually doing pre-orders on and then placing the PO. And then uh, in HO, um, we're doing, this, we're really excited about this one, the CSX Heritage Series. Yes. So we're doing the first five. And uh, CSX, um, on the first five, there's some, like, the older colors that they didn't quite get correct. Right. But CSX is supplying us with all the paint coats so we can match those colors. Oh, oh that's cool. <laughs> there, there, <it's> kind of <laughs> All right, well, let's call it a day here. Perfect. Say goodbye, uh, Shane. Say goodbye, Shane. Goodbye, Lionel. <laughs>
So what was I going to say? It couldn't have been that good. Oh, well, if you if you want to learn about hockey, come to the Modelers Life podcast. Not so much yes. uh, model railroading, but plenty about hockey. Um, it's just that we're Canadian. We were bred that way, blah, blah, blah. And a little uh, a side note to your Detroit All-Star story. A yes. little known fact, uh, Detroit, Michigan is north of Windsor, Ontario. Absolutely, it is. Bye. And here's another, here's another hockey fact thrown in just for fun. Uh, we uh, I think most of us will recognize the name, the great Gordie Howe, who played many years for the Detroit Red Wings. Well, there's a new bridge between Windsor and Detroit being constructed, and it is being called the Gordie Howe Bridge. I think it should be called the Elbow Bridge. There you go. <laughs> or elbows up. <laughs> elbows up bridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause Gordy was known to uh go into a corner and he was a big fella. He wasn't a little guy. And uh he liked to go in with his elbows up a little bit and uh, you know, kind of give guys a face wash and stuff, man. That's was the days in the Well, like I've told this story before. Those the good old days, all right. Yeah, but I told I told this story before, not that long ago, that when I was 13, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, and I played on some of the teams. Uh, fighting was encouraged. Yep. <laughs> hey, Strang, go out there and teach that guy a lesson. Okay, he didn't, cool. Yeah, he didn't do nothing. Well, go out and make something up then. Go go yeah. ring his bell. I mean, yes. and then of course, the, then of course, there's a story where Gordy Howe was receiving some stitches to a face and uh, telling the uh, the doc to uh, train her to hurry up and get it done. and. And on his way out, he says, uh, the, the trainer's getting ready to leave. He says, uh, no, you just stay right here. The guy did this to him being shortly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was Shane Wilson, scale trains, uh, b- about an hour and 15 minutes of Shane Wilson yes. talking about uh, the original interview of the Retail Wars. I thought it went really well. I hope yep. Shane did, too. I felt it was, uh, it was a good interview. And then uh, Shane is pretty forthcoming. I find Shane yep. to be a like I always any questions with Shane I always have the, I always use the same approach. Here's a question, answer it if you want. If you don't feel comfortable answering it, don't answer it. I, I, I'm good either yeah. way. Uh, yeah. He's a pretty straight shooter. Exactly, but if you don't answer the question, there's a good likelihood I'll just pester you to death with a various other questions that will try to work my way around to the original question. I always have a backup plan. Yeah, always I got to have a backup plan. And then we did about 15 minutes at Springfield, which was kind of cool to hear the two yep. uh, things together. And yep. we ha- we made a little introduction, and now we're doing a little wrap-up. And there that's it. It's on the free channel. And so the it's on import- the free channel. Yeah, so wow. the important thing to remember is somewhere out there, somewhere out there that somebody that's listening to this podcast right now is at their workbench working on their Rapido trains. Your fast track to model railroading fun. If it's M, if it's H O, the fast track is Rapido. Boom. All right. So, uh, can you give out our email address, Bruce? Yes, our email address. Please uh, send us emails. We love emails, and we will endeavor to read your email on viewer mail at some time. We don't know when it will be, but we'll get to it sooner or later. Send us an email at modelerslife at gmail.com. That's modelers, the one L like llama, not two L's like llama. There you go. Uh, and if you didn't catch that address, if you go to our website, amodelerslife.com, and scroll down just a little bit, either on your phone, your iPad, or your uh, laptop computer, or your tabletop, whatever yeah. your device is. Whatever is, internet, whatever device you use to connect to the internet. Yeah. And scroll down just a little bit, boom. There's a picture of the moderately agitated male boy in a particularly agitated state. And if you just click on that picture, the address will be filled out for you and you're ready to go. All you do is put Absolutely. in your title and your content and hit send. What could be simpler? What could be simpler? And we love getting emails. That's like one of my we favorite absolutely shows. Absolutely love. It's always fun doing that. I think uh, regardless of the day that this is being recorded, I think tomorrow we'll do another viewer mail. Beautiful. I love doing viewer mails. Um, yes. They 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 write themselves. They do. Well, we don't. Oh, somebody writes them. We don't write them. Right. They do come in. They do come in ready to go. And if you enjoyed this podcast, and you like thinking to yourself, "Boy, I wish I could get as twice as much of this podcast." What you can get twice as much? Yeah, you just go to our Patreon link and click on that, and for just a few cents a day, you can have twice as much podcasting a week. And well, who who wouldn't want that? And for just a few more cents a day. 
you can be you can go to the next tier, which includes a free t- T-shirt once a year, a bunch of stickers, uh, other knickknacks, coasters, poker chips of Kelly, all sorts of cool stuff. And uh, then you're also entered into, hey, dude, where's my shirt? The, the, the contest that's sweeping the nation, it sweeping is. the globe. Yeah. The real, the real name of the contest is, when will I get my t-shirt? But the nickname of the contest is, hey, dude, where's my shirt? Which I kind of enjoy. Yes. Um, and uh, I think that's it. And, oh, yeah, the last thing we have speaking, to touch. Speaking of, speaking of t-shirts. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bruce, have you ever wanted a t-shirt with a hot dog on it? Absolutely. Who wouldn't want a t-shirt with a hot dog on it? Well, if you go to Midwest Model Railroad, and their URL is MidwestModelRR.com, and scroll across the menu bar to Other, and click and on the drop-down menu, you'll see an AML shop, AML merchandise shop. You just go in there, and boom, you're in a wonderland of hats, hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, whatever you could possibly need, golf visors. Anything that you need is in that store. And your one-stop AML shop. It's your one-stop AML shop. That's right. And, uh, yeah, that's all on uh, mod- Modeler, MidwestModelRR.com. MidwestModelRR.com. Right. And I think we got everything. I think we got everything. Except for one. We talked about email. We talked about T-shirts and hot dogs. Yeah. Except for one important fact that we need to emphasize here as much as possible. Okay. Uh, uh, this is what you hear on the AML, the Modelers Life podcast, is authentic model railroad gibberish. Other except pe- no imitations. Except no imitations. Other people try to duplicate it. It can't be done. The only people that are offering you authentic model railroad gibberish are the folks at the AML Nation, the Modelers Life podcast. There you go. That's it. I think we're done. Are you ready? All right. All right. So remember, remember, a Modeler's Life podcast is considered marginally adequate by 6 out of 10 purveyors of authentic model railroad gibberish. Mr. Strang's wardrobe provided by The Dashing Camper. For all your fashion and tent repair needs, trust The Dashing Camper. It's another Lincoln Homer.